This is episode 168 of the Stem Cell Podcast, The Organoid Godfather, with he himself, Dr. Hans Clevers. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Dalon James and Dr. Arun Sharma. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge in stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. Do you guys want links to all the papers discussed in each episode? Subscribe to our newsletter and you'll get a summary of each episode, including links to interview and roundup papers delivered straight to your inbox each time a new episode comes out. Today, we have a very special episode. Dr. Hans Clevers from the Hubrecht Institute. He's on the podcast to talk about his pioneering research in wind signaling, LGR5 stem cells, and of course, organoids, organoids, organoids. We're going to talk about organoids a bit. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights and stem cell news coming up. But first, stem cell technologies would like to introduce their one-stop resource for researchers who are using or looking to use organoids in their experiments. Stem Cell's Organoid Information Hub provides scientists with instructional videos, educational webinars, expert interviews, technical tips, and curated publications to help researchers set it up and optimize organoids as a research model in their labs. Learn more about organoid culture from the experts at Stem Cell and visit www.stemcell.com slash discover dash organoids. Before we dive into the organoid side of things, we're going to talk a little bit about something else that we love here on the podcast, and that's single cell biology. Okay, Hans Cleavers, uh, he said it himself, this wouldn't be a a stem cell podcast episode if we didn't talk about single cell at some point, right? So I'm going to lead off with a story from UCLA. A human skeletal muscle atlas identifies the trajectories of stem and progenitor cells across development and from human pluripotent stem cells. So this is a study that, you know, just came out from cell stem cell, um, pioneered by April Pyle and Catherine Plath over there at the UCLA Stem Cell Institute. They're able to identify uh, different cell types that are found in skeletal muscle tissues from early embryonic development all the way up to adulthood. And they're focusing on muscle progenitor cells, which are contributing to muscle formation before birth, and muscle stem cells too, which contribute to muscle formation after birth. Uh, as well as to regeneration, you know, from injury, muscle injury, right? And so in combination, these two groups were able to map out how the different gene networks in these cells uh, change as these cells mature. And of course, they use single cell as their workhorse approach to do this. This is a roadmap, and it's a critical roadmap for researchers who are aiming to develop muscle stem cells in the lab from pluripotent stem cells, for example. And maybe one day you can use these cells for regenerative cell therapy for different muscle diseases, including the dystrophies, sarcopenia, and age-related loss of muscle mass and strength. So it's thought that muscle loss due to aging or disease is the result of dysfunctional muscle stem cells, right? And this is a map that's identifying the gene networks that are present in these progenitor and stem cells across the differentiation and development. So they're looking at these PAX7 positive cells. And kind of in a nutshell, they're able to show that, as you might expect, these cells differ in terms of their gene expression profiles over the course of life and also over the course of differentiation. I think the critical thing here is that they're able to uh, do a bunch of differentiation analysis across multiple IPS lines and really confirm something that we already kind of knew, that the stem cell and pluripotent stem cell derived muscle cells are immature and they actually exhibit a gene pattern that's more resembling a fetal-like transcriptional pattern. It's something that you know we've <laughs> discussed a lot on this show. These stem cell and IPS derived tissues are immature and this is another confirmatory study of that. So it's uh, it's an atlas based project. This is certainly that's this is so, certainly something that's a very hot topic right now, sort of off topic. But when it comes to single cell biology, there was actually a huge piece of news that dropped uh, this week. One of the pioneers in single cell and whose name we've actually mentioned a few times on the show, Aviv Regev, has actually left the Broad Institute. This is 
big time news. She's a real pioneer in single cell biology and a real uh, incredibly innovative scientist. She's left the Broad Institute to take a very senior position at Genentech on the West Coast, I believe. Uh, I think she's going to be one of the senior vice presidents of research. Um, so single cell biology, you know, a lot of people are working on it. And perhaps, you know, as you can see with the case of Avi Regev, it's making the, the jump to the translational and the, the drug discovery side of things as well. Wow, that's exciting for Avi. She's trying to get paid. I respect that. I'm sure. I hope they made it worthwhile. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm with you. I think that once the, the science crosses over to Genentech of all places, I mean, that's not some you know, founder company. That's a big deal. So clearly uh, they're taking the reins here and trying to translate these technologies. You know, talking about this story, again, we, you said it. We talk about the, the maturity of these cells. But I was wondering, is that like, is there a spin there that they kind of took that, that there's a positive there? Are the, are the adult skeletal muscle progenitors, are they like less potent? And then maybe that the pluripotent cell derived uh, progenitors may be more therapeutic or is, is the, the rationale for deriving from her human pluripotent stem cells just like the patient specific IPS angle? Do you know? I think they're still trying to push the angle that we want these things to be mature. I think that was really the one of the major intentions of this roadmap was to kind of figure out how do we actually get these cells on par with the real adult thing. And, you know, I think there's still a lot of work that needs to happen here. That's fair. I guess you're right there. If, if I had to get some therapy, I wouldn't want any little baby muscles. I want some, you know, man-sized muscles. You know what I mean, Arun? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> if you say so. Yes, he says, sure. That's what I hear a lot from Arun. He's, he's very careful, properly. Good for you, buddy. I got another story <laughs> that's about single cell. You talk about single cell biology workhorse. I got one that I'll, it's like single cell on steroids. This is uh, from Elaine Fuchs from my alma mater, uh, Rockefeller University. She's not playing here with her single cell seek. I'm gonna cut to the chase. She went single cell RNA seek, ATAC seek, chip seek, all that. Um, but let's step back. Uh, the idea here is, you know, if you know Elaine, you know that she studies the skin, that's her model system. And in this case, she uses it to try and gain insight into like an age old question, which is how do these progenitors in the adult balance, self-renewal, and differentiation. Of course, it's critical for maintenance of the tissue homeostasis as well as regeneration, right? Um, and during that homeostasis, you have all this kind of repressive action from the knee signals that establishes a stable gene expression to maintain the stem cell identity and have whatever steady state self-renewal. Um, in large part, that's like an epigenetic process with all these regulators. And then, of course, you have disturbance of that niche environment, right? You wound. Um, that triggers a rapid rewiring of these regulatory programs. Uh, and then, of course, you, they have to then go back to the steady state once the regeneration and renewal has taken place, right? So there's a very fine-tuned gene expression program that is necessary to execute the lineage, uh, proper lineage differentiation and all the wound repair programs. And that happens with real high precision. Okay. And it's why, why we get cuts and they look, you know, minimal scar on the back end. You can hardly see it. Um, but the question is how do the, the transcriptional response, uh, programs, how do they respond to the, this wound? How do they respond to the perturbations? And then how do they switch back to that homeostatic state? Uh, the hair follicle, as Elaine Fuchs and her group has shown over the decades, is a really great model for studying stem cell biology because it transitions through this, this, these different um, episodes, the wounding and then the homeostasis, and you can study it uh, with high precision. Um, and so, you know, when you're looking at the embryonic stem cells that we know so well, it's very well established that there's these master factors, these transcription factors that bind cooperatively in these super enhancers, right? And that regulates the kind of master pluripotent program. Similarly, in the bulge stem cells in the skin, they express this cohort, of a different cohort of transcription factors that bind within super enhancers similarly. So the Fuchs group, they were intrigued by this one family of transcription factors that may fall into this class of master factors. They're called the nuclear factor 
I, our nuclear factor one family. Um, why were they intrigued? Because this NFIB binds within most of these bulge stem cell super enhancers. Um, and interestingly, although so they looked at loss of function, this NFIB uh, previously, it's been looked at, and there's no phenotype, um, but there's also this other factor, NFIX, which is closely related also in the bulge SC, so they thought there was this compensatory effect. So that's what led them to these two factors, NFIB, NFIX. Um, also, when you look in small cell lung cancer METs, the NFIB uh, locus, there's this amplification of NFIB, and what that results in is increased chromatin accessibility. So that's where they get this kind of epigenetic angle here. NFIB, NFIX, how are they um, modulating or controlling the epigenetic uh, landscape in the bulge stem cells? And no one really knows about this. No one knows how specifically they've looked in cancer and shown that there's this increased chromatin accessibility, but nobody knows how these NFI proteins function in like a physiological context. So what did they do? Like I said, they went Rambo with the seek, chip, you know, chip seek, ATAC seek, single cell RNA seek um, in this like spatiotemporal, you know, Fuchs lab famously did this spatiotemporal gene ablation in their hair uh, follicle models. And what they showed is that the bulge stem cells, they lose their hair regenerating ca capability when you knock out these two things. And, and interestingly, from a clinical perspective, they make uh, mice with skin that has a really strong resemblance to irre irreversible human alopecia. Um, by the way, if you look at irreversible human alopecia, there's also a reduction in these NFI proteins. So there's clinical relevance there. Uh, and then using all of these single, the single cell biology, they, they sh expose a, a real mechanistic and critical role for NFIB and X in governing these super enhancers. Um, and when you lose them, the epigenetic landscape that's unique to stemness is lost and you get these unwanted lineages that are usually repressed, they become derepressed and therefore you get these off target phenotypes um, like the irreversible human alopecia. So. I mean, this is deep mechanistic study, typical of the Fuchs lab. They really look at all the, the moving pieces here. But again, with the with clinical bent, there's a lot of bald people out there that are like, ah, NFIX, I got to go after that. Really, I don't know that that's really going to be a clinical in, in, uh, entry point. Um, but as always, very elegant study and uh, maybe some understanding of, of just the epigenetics of stem cell uh, niches generally. Um, and whether or not NFI proteins have a role there. Uh, speaking of bald people, I definitely need a haircut right now, man. You can look at me through my Skype window. My hair is going all over the place. You know, I'm just stuck inside. Might have to resort to someone around here just, you know, off the street giving me a haircut. But uh, desperate times, right? Anyways, when it comes to seek and organoids, seek and organoids, I kind of feel like a broken record here. But that's, you know, what we're talking about on this episode. And this is a seek heavy um paper that you've covered here with ATAC-seq, CHIP-seq, single cell transcriptomics, but I think it's really answering an important biological question about super enhancers, right? Super enhancers have really taken off in terms of um, a topic of study over the last few years. These non-coding portions of the genome that are playing a critical role, not just in stem cell maintenance, but overall cellular function. And there's so much we don't know about them. So just big picture, you know, less than 1% of the genome is, is a coding portion of the genome. And back in the day, people used to think that, oh, the rest of the 99% of the genome is just garbage, which is of course not true at all, right? You have these massive super enhancer networks that are perhaps playing as important or if not more important roles in regulating gene function. So a lot of really cool, exciting work in super enhancer biology these days coming out. Yes. Uh, trying to shed light on that dark genome there. And I mean, you, st you said uh, at the beginning of your comment there, all the seek and the fatigue and all that. And yeah, I think that this is going to become, you know, I, of course, the editors, we've talked about it, they're, they're going to probably fatigue of the seek. It's not enough just to have single cell anything in your paper to get a high profile journal. But now what <laughs> I see the uh, what what the Fuchs lab is doing here and I'm, I'm worried that you can't just 
do single cell RNA seq anymore. You, you really have to do the ATAC seq and the chip seq to see those other dimensions. It's not enough just to see the, the transcriptional landscape anymore, but you really have to see, you know, the epigenetic landscape and, and, and the accessibility of the chromatin is going to become another dimension that's going to be necessary to kind of make sense of all this big data. So I'm afraid because it's going to cost me another probably hundred thousand dollars this year <laughs> to pay for all that. Hey, you're doing a lot of seek, right? I mean, how's that going? How's your seek experiments going right oh now? Oh my gosh. You know, I'm above a hundred thousand cells and that's, that's when I realized that it's time to stop. You know, there's no magic number. If I gave him a million cells, I don't think the editors would be any more excited, but it's great. I must say single cell seek it's so much fun. If you have ever, you know, waded through any RNA-seq data, you know, if you're like me, you're a real geek about it and you're just rubbing your hands together, can't wait to dig in and you could spend weeks just pouring over all the permutations. Well, single cell seq is just like that. And I, you know, no false modesty, I've mastered Surratt because, you know, I couldn't really pay a bioinformatician to, to render all the data for me. So it's forced a little bit of growth on my part. And, you know, it's a bit of a rabbit hole, Arun, but you know that already, don't you? Mm -hmm. I might have to test you on your expertise with Surat, oh, but we can get around to that. <laughs> oh, man. If you like looking at little dots, then single cell is definitely the assay for you. But shifting gears a little bit, we're going to talk about another study that's actually using some single cell studies, some single cell analysis. Title of this paper is Zonation of Ribosomal DNA Transcription Defines a Stem Cell Hierarchy in Colorectal Cancer. So we are talking a little bit more about cancer here, colorectal cancer. Uh, this is coming from Barcelona. Last author here is Edward Battle. And the premise of this story is that uh, colorectal cancer and tumors in general are not uniform. We know this, right? Tumors are mixed bags of cells. Then there's some stem cell-like populations up there in, in tumors. There's differentiated populations as well. And in colon cancer, you have uh, cells that are these stem cell-like populations that are uh, fueling the tumor growth and ultimately causing metastasis. So these folks at, at Barcelona have shown that the essence of so-called pluripotency in these colon cancer stem cells actually lies in their ability to make proteins, you know, ribosomal activity, which is a property that could be investigated further as a therapeutic target. I thought this was a cool paper because a lot of times when we talk about tumors, we're looking at cells based on their transcriptional identities. But this is saying that we have to profile cells based on their ability to synthesize proteins. And that's how you're actually identifying these stem cell populations that are doing the damage. So current treatments for colon cancer aren't super efficient because they don't always eliminate all these so-called pluripotent cells in these, uh, in these cancers. And different research groups have shown that when these cancer stem cells are removed through experimental approaches, that other differentiated cells can actually revert back to a so-called pluripotent state and regenerate the tumor. And this is something that we've talked about a little bit on the podcast, this idea of plasticity, where cells can revert back and forth from one phenotype to another. So here they're able to show, and this is another cell stem cell paper, they're able to show that protein synthesis in tumors is occurring in specific regions that's coinciding with these cancer stem cell niches. And these tumors also have a protein production gradient, okay? And one, once this production capacity is exhausted, the tumor cells can lose their capacity to actually return back to the cancer stem cell state. So this plasticity is lost. And so it's this biosynthetic ability that's allowing these cancer stem cells to contribute to unlimited tumor growth, right? And uh, as I mentioned, it's it's important because we're identifying, or they're identifying, we're not doing anything, they're identifying a unique method of perhaps targeting tumor cells within cancer uh, niches and colon cancer in particular. You can identify these cells based on their ability to highly express ribosomal uh, function. And in fact, I think the the protein that they're actually using here to mark these high biosynthetically active cells is RNA polymerase 1 subunit A or POLR1A, okay? And they're, when you genetically ablate these POLR1A high populations using CRISPR, that's when you have the really strong effect 
on these colon cancer uh, tumors. And then you get, a, you know, kind of an ablation of the tumor itself. Um, this is talking, you know, a little bit about this LGR5 positive and LGR5 negative tumor cells, which is something that obviously our guest today, Hans Klebers, knows a lot about. He's not only a master of the gut, he's a master of the organoids. And oh man, dude, I'm just so excited. I can't believe we've we got Hans Klebers on the show, the man himself, Mr. Organoid. I am just hyped right now, man. Can't wait. Yeah, I can't wait either. And uh you know, we're going to have to tap it down, the enthusiasm, because we have another roundup story, Arun. I mean, we can't get Sorry. right to the interview, for goodness sake. We're still talking about colorectal for a second here. Uh, I like the, the angle here uh, more than anything about this paper. I like a, a unique angle, unique approach for the readout using the ribosomal DNA transcription. It's, it's cool to me. Because anytime you do something like this, I think there's a lot of people out there in cancer, but also elsewhere, like, huh, ribosomal DNA, oh, oh, man, 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 look at that. The question <laughs> I have there is ribosomal, just by virtue of the title, I didn't de read it deep like you, um, but I'm guessing that, like, then that there's just, an, there's all, there's a lot of transcripts always. There's a, surfe uh, a surplus of mm -hmm. transcripts in every cell. And the bottleneck in any cell is how many ribosomes there are to translate it. And that's like, again, this is, it just changed my perspective on, on this, the biology of every cell that that's it's a thing I never even considered that maybe it's just transcripts, um, are there and, uh, ramping up the ribosomal production can be the difference between a cell behaving like a stem cell or mm -hmm. maybe a quiescent, uh, progenitor or maybe an active trans amplifier. So I like that. That's a cool angle. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And, um, you know, it's all connected, right? Like the ribosomal activity is, of course, connected to the transcriptional activity. And perhaps in general, these cancer stem cells are just hyperactive across the board. And that's a reason why they're you know, easy to target because they're the cells that are really doing all the work within the context of this big mass of tumor, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, I really like this paper because as I mentioned, you know, most of the time when we look at cancer tumors, we're focusing on transcription activity, but perhaps we need to look at the full gamut. We need to look at the full metabolic function, biosynthetic function, transcriptional function, seek function, blah, 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 all that seeks. Let's do everything, man. Let's just profile everything all at once, right? If we had unlimited money, right, which I know you do, why don't we just do that? Yeah, I was going to say who's paying for this, but um, I guess I'm on the hook. Seek everything, all seeks. Um, so yeah, LGR5 and uh, segue to uh, another segue to our guests. I'm talking about organoids. I'm not just talking about organoids. I'm talking about intestinal organoids, the specialty of Mr. Clevers, Dr. Clevers, the clever Clevers. Um, and this is about COVID too. It's everything. It's everything that we're about to talk about, but it's just not out of the Clevers lab for a change, we have a paper on organoids that's not coming out of his lab. This is a paper out of Jizu and uh, Kwok Yung Yen, um, who are in the University of Hong Kong. This is bat organoids, and this is so cool. It's not just bat, actually. Some human organoids, some patient organoids. Um, so cool on all fronts, but the bat in the headline is what really grabs the attention. So we know about COVID at this point. We said we were just going to do one special episode on COVID, but it slipped into the roundup once again. Please forgive me. Um, we're going to do it anyway. There's this this thing with the COVID patients that the, the list of symptoms keeps being extended. So it's pretty much everything. If you're, you know, if you, if you have like a, a pain in a hair follicle, you might have COVID. But amongst some of the other fever, cough, shortness of breath, there's also a subset of patients that have gastrointestinal symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And there's been, the viral RNA has been test, uh, detected in stool, right? Uh, so when you're looking at the genome, and some, some news has come out since clearly this has been in press, but uh, we'll talk about it in the post. But when you look at the genome sequence analysis of this COVID, um, it shows 96% identity to the bat coronavirus that we've known in the past, one of them, and 88% to another, a couple of them. So the idea there was that this probably originated in bats, may have originated in bats. Also, because bats are a natural reservoir for all kinds of viruses, particularly these RNA viruses that cause serious disease in humans, right? Um, but it's tough with bats because, you know, when they were looking back in the days of the original SARS in the early aughts, 
there was um, a lot of sampling, right, from bats, and they detected a, you know, a ton. They would do fecal specimens uh, or anal swabs from these horseshoe bats, right, where, where you see the star, where they studied in this story. And they'd get a lot of viral genome fragments, but they could never, like, get them going. You could never study them because you couldn't get them going in a cell line. Right, so the the for that reason the viruses weren't never really isolated and cultivated. Also, there's reports of primary cell cultures of bats and immortalized bat cell lines, and you can even buy them on ATCC. But isolation of any kind of SARS or coronavirus um, using bat cell lines never been reported. Right, so the horseshoe bat. Right, this is this is the one that was proposed to be the natural host of SARS, although we're not sure about that. Um, but there was still no evidence that the that SARS could even infect these bats. Uh, and like I said, you don't have like an in vitro model where you can get bat cells and check them out. Um, so enter Jiju and Kwok Yung Yuen, and they uh, uh, started with uh, this idea, you know, the human gastrointestinal tract, it's also just a common route of invasion. And you can make human intestinal organoids, right, uh, for modeling these types of infections. So they put two and two together there and said, let's get some organoids from the bat. Uh, and they, they did. They uh, uh, established, they characterized, and ex they expanded these intestinal organoids from horseshoe bats. They show that they, similarly to the seminal work from cleavers, they could, they could recapitulate this uh, epithelial growth phenomenon. Um, and of course, these enteroids, as they call bat enteroids, they're fully susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 infection and they sustain robust viral replication. So that answers that. Looks like they can be infected. Um, but also here, I thought a little a footnote, uh, which is highly important, not really a footnote, it was a major point, uh, focus of the study also. They also got human intestinal organoids, uh, which, you know, Hans is on the on the show today to talk about the recent paper that he did there showing a similar thing. Um, they got active replication in the human organoids and uh, getting a, a stool specimen from a patient that had COVID uh, and diarrheal symptoms. They isolated virus and showed that it was live and they showed that it was infectious and robust. And that's, that's critical, uh, I think, because now we can open up that line of inquiry, it looks like viral shedding and feces is a mode of transmission. Not great news, but at least we know it for sure. So uh, a bunch of things in this paper, I have bat was in the headline. And I think there's been a lot of like in the culture and social media, bat soup and all that nonsense. So, I mean, bat has been a focal point. Uh, but although, I mean, I don't know that we're sure right now, the recent paper in Nature show that it was likely the pangolin. Um, that was really the natural reservoir here. Uh, but still, you know, there's a, bats are a natural reservoir for a ton of viruses. And this is a, this, they're, they're a problem. If they haven't been in the past or the present, they will be in the future. So now we have a means of, kind of studying that in a more physiological uh, model uh, with the bat organoid. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, no, certain papers just have a cool factor about them. And this is definitely one of them, right? The fact that you can make organoids from bat intestine, that's just wild to me. And I was, you know, when you said this to me, I took a quick dive into the methods because I was wondering, you know, it's got to be pretty tough to actually culture these bat organoids, right? You probably have to have some sort of custom cell culture media just to keep these things alive. But unless I'm reading this wrong, I think the culture media for the bat and the human organoids was exactly the same, which is mind blowing to me. And it also kind of tells you something about the robustness of the system. The fact that you can just isolate some cells from whatever species you might be interested in, whether it's bat, pangolin, whatever you have a focus on. Uh, you can really easily theoretically grow organoids from that species to study, I don't know, a million different things like, you know, species specific differences in virus uh, capacity and susceptibility or evolutionary biology. So it just reinforces the fact that organoids are the wave of the future and it's a very robust, powerful technology. Yeah, that's a cool insight. I didn't think of that. Uh, 
that, yeah, this is such a, a highly conserved system maybe and the, the apparatus in order to maintain it is, is so robust. I wonder on the, on the flip side of that, if, if you can, let's say that all organites from all species are, can pretty much be cultured in the same recipe, it'd be interesting to see uh, if there's some strange, weird, I mean, bats, I know, they're relatively close to humans, um, but it'd be interesting to see if there's some other weird, not weird, but very different, uh, in particular from maybe a gastrointestinal standpoint, different um, animal and see how those organoids play. But won't be long. I'm expecting to see some intestinal organoids all over the map. Um, and on that note, uh, we have a very special bit of news. And because this is a special episode from a very special investigator, um, we have a, a, a unique twist for this show, and it's not really because we made it happen. It's because it's Hans Clevers. And Hans Clevers, even though he has a story that just barely came out and we're covering it, he probably, of course, also has a story that's in press somewhere. And lo and behold, he let us know that he does. So we're going to have a little bit of a, of a guest roundup spot from Dr. Clevers briefly, uh, and then we'll get to the interview. Yeah, so the paper that will come out this week, uh, done by Hugh Bömer, uh, Jens Pushoff, two PhD students, mostly, with lots of collaborators. They delve more deeply into uh, enterendocrine cells of the human gut. We had a previous paper of enterendocrine cells in a mouse, but mice eat very different things. They, they feed in a very different way. So... Um, what they did is they did a lot of single cell sequencing. Well, I don't know you guys like this. Uh, <laughs> uh, and they found a way to induce enterendocrine cells. We have a, always a few of them. They're rare cells in the gut, but also in meningo. But if you inducibly express neurogenin 3, which is the master regulator of that lineage, you get massive amounts of enterendocrine cells of all types. There's about six, seven different types. And also, if you do it in a proximal gut, you get different types. And if you do it in organized from the distal gut, exactly as what you see in real life. And then they, um, by single cell sequencing, found all the known hormones, found presumably new hormones, found the receptors that these cells use to sense whatever they sense in the, uh, in the gut lumen. They had a sense nutrients or maybe metabolize of the microbiome. And in response, they secrete specific hormones, which then prepare the body for more food or more calories or stop you from eating or induce you to eat. Or, so they're very interesting cells and very poorly studied because they are so rare. And then they did even a secretome by mass spec. So they, uh, they let the cells secrete their hormones. And then uh, by mass spec, the term it was produced. This was done together with Albert Heck's lab here in, in Utrecht. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you can see all the different hormones back, but also like the glucagon gene produces glucagon. But if it's alternatively processed, you get GLP-1, GLP-2, and there's other peptides that come off this. So they actually, they got a complete spectrum of peptides that, that are being produced by these, by these uh, L cells. Uh, so it's a bit of a, it's, it's a typical human cell atlas paper, I think, mm -hmm. where we very deeply describe these cells, both at the RNA and at the, at the protein level. All right. That was a nice synopsis from Dr. Clevers. But before we get to that, we have a brief message from stem cell. Looking for more information on organoids? Download Stem Cell Technologies' new ebook on organoid research techniques. Developed in collaboration with Wiley Publishing, this essential knowledge briefing details the evolution of organoid technologies from discovery to application, including discussion of key milestones and advances in the technology. A review of key publications and annotated reading lists provide further background on many of the topics covered. Download your copy at www.stemcell.com slash organoid ebook. And I can guarantee you're going to see many stories from our guest without wasting any further time. Let's get to that. All right, you guys, today we have a very special guest on the show, Dr. Hans Clevers. Wow. He's group leader at the Hubrecht Institute for Developmental Biology and Stem Cell Research. Needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. His group studies the molecular mechanisms of tissue development and cancer of various organs using organoids. We talk about those a lot. Organoids made from adult LGR5 stem cells. Dr. Clevers pioneered research into Wnt, uncovered the Wnt signals that control gene expression, Looking beyond the embryogenesis, he unveiled the role of wind signaling in colon cancer and its physiological counterpart, 
the self-renewing gut epithelium, pioneered the discovery of LGR5 as a marker of tissue stem cells. The list goes on. I mean, he's done a lot of things in, in not so much time. Dr. Clavers, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon to you too. Um, I'm going to jump right into you know, the science, but let's just take a step back. I mean, you have a lot of stories almost every week. We've been covering your scientific output pretty much, I mean, this literally, pretty much every other episode for the last couple of years. So we're familiar with your work, but let's go back, like I said to the beginning, you were the first to observe intestinal stem cells, the first to clone TCF, first to connect aberrant wind signaling to colon cancer, first to generate organoids. And we're talking way, way before organoids were super sexy like they are now. And like I said, the list goes on and on. Um, now it seems obvious, all these ideas, but what was the thinking back then? What was your thinking when you first shed light on this concept of intestinal stem cells? What drove your interest into that uh, and uh, your insight into the intestine? Well, so this goes back a long, long way. I started my lab after a postdoc in Boston uh, in uh, 1989, and I was actually a professor in immunology then. Um, we were trying to clone transcription factors that were defining T lymphocytes. That was the idea, because people had learned that uh, fates of cells are set by transcription factors. You have to realize that PCR was just invented, was not really accessible to most labs. There was no genome. We believe there were maybe 100 or 200,000 genes. Uh, we had none, anyway, none of the technology that we now have were in existence other than monoclonal antibodies and CDNA cloning. And um, so we found an transcription factor that we then current turned TCF1, T cell factor one. And it took us about five or six years to realize that uh, it had no important role to play in T lymphocytes, but it actually, so it was a lousy transcription factor. It binds DNA, mm. but it didn't do anything. Hmm. And then after five or six years, simultaneously with uh, uh, Birgmeier in, in Germany, um, who became a friend afterwards, um, we linked TCF to wind signaling. It turned out that TCF on its own doesn't do anything. But then with this cofactor beta-catenin, it becomes an activator of transcription. And beta-catenin was the, then the endpoint of the wind pathway. So we realized, well, we have we have an answer to an important question, but it was not our own question, it was somebody else's question. And that that essentially, I think, has defined my lab for a long, long time, that we always find answers to questions that we never posed. Mm. And uh, so I actually, over time, I realized that that is probably the best way for at least my lab to work, is basically just do experiments, have no hypotheses, don't ask deep questions, but just look. And there's always an interesting phenomenon. Mm. And then when uh, I can now, you know, after having done this for a long time, admit to them when you write a paper, you <laughs> often figure 1A is the final experiment you did because you need a reason you know, to do this, to that which never existed, mm. uh, to, to do the study. And uh, so when you read these papers, they all sound very logical. But if you, yeah, like in many cases, the story was usually totally reversed. And maybe the final, the final figure was actually uh, the first observation that we then figured out what it was and we found out, well, maybe this is important. And then finally we, we, we put it in the paper. So after I started as an immunologist, we found TCF1 and actually you need TCF1 to make T cells. And it actually has gotten its own life now in immunology, but we really stopped working on it soon after. We then became a developmental biology lab. So we did flies and we did worms and we did frogs. And, uh, and then we hit upon the gut. And that was that was one of the few real eye openers that I realized this is a fantastic organ, and everybody in the world who studied this organ, or I should say almost everybody, studied the diseased organ. Mm -hmm. And there was no very few people were interested in the healthy gut, uh, and that's very different, for instance, in immunology or in hematology, where there's as many basic scientists study how things normally work well, and then others study the disease, and often these things come together. So um, we realized that wind was driving stem cells. You mentioned this in the introduction. Uh, and then we realized that the gut stem cells were the champions of all stem cells. They, they, are, they produce massive amounts of tissue. They replace the inner lining of the gut every five or six days. Um, so the champions, what we call them. Um, 
And it took us a long time to find them. And it was done by Nick Barker in the lab, who's now in, uh, in Singapore. And he, uh, so he finally found this marker, LGR5, which marked the wrong cells in the wrong place. They were not behaving as they should because they were dividing and stem cells should not divide. And there were too many of them because stem cells should be rare. And uh, so, but uh, I think now people have accepted that they are, they are the stem cells. And then, and that's actually then, got us into this organoid business. Because when we saw these stem cells being so actively dividing, uh, we thought well, we, there should be a way of mimicking this in the lab. Mm -hmm. And this was again against this common belief that stem cells cannot be cultured. So it was, uh, you get them out of a body, you put them in a petri dish, you have to rapidly study them. Uh, because they die in a week or they undergo senescence or, so, or apoptosis or anoikis or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, so that was sort of the, the history of my lab. Uh, thanks again for joining us, Dr. Cleavers. From flies to gut organoids to COVID-19 most recently, I think it's, uh, you know, I think you've covered quite a bit in your scientific history. So I think the timing is pretty perfect to have you here on the show since, as I mentioned, you just published a big time paper on COVID-19 in science not too long ago, and your lab used intestinal organoids to examine the mechanisms of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And so we'll let you expand on that story. What did you find after infecting these organoids and what's next? Yeah, so the idea was um, simple. Uh, this was actually a, a project where we did have a plan beforehand of what we want, what we <laughs> hope to see, and because um, there were lots of lots of re clinical reports that that uh, COVID nineteen is not just a respiratory disease, but it affects other organs, kidneys. Patients often have kidney failure uh, after they've been at the ICUs, uh, but also a lot of gastrointestinal problems, vomiting. Um, diarrhea, abdominal pains, uh, particularly in kids. And my youngest son just came out of medical school and uh, was given the task of running a, a corona unit in oh, uh, in a hospital. Wow. And he also told me that that he had several patients where there was no respiratory problems at all. They were just they were having these gastrointestinal uh, symptoms. And uh, and then we went in lockdown, the institute, and I had to think of you know stuff to keep us all busy. Hmm. And, one of the major virologists in Holland actually lives in my street. So I called her up and they said, well, you know, we can grow gut organoids and you can actually, you have the virus, you have the biosafety labs, you have the antibodies, you have the tests and uh, shall we do something together? This was March 15. So we then hooked up. I, I, I lined up another friend of mine, Peter Peters, who, uh, who is this wizard electron microscopy guy who always adds one or two figures to our, to our papers. And, um, and then actually, so the paper, as you noticed, was online on the 1st of May, I believe. So this was done in like seven mm -hmm. weeks. And this involved two rounds of review with three serious reviewers. It was not, there was no shortcut. Mm -hmm. It was a simple study and it all worked out the first time. We duplicated it once. And uh, anyway, so the observation is that uh, the virus, and we had SARS, the original SARS virus as a control, that it uh, readily infects um, gut organoids and it affects the enterocytes, which are the most abundant cell lines, uh, cell, uh, cell types in the, in the organoid. Um, they produce massive amounts of infectious particles. So this makes it uh, very likely that, the, well, the virus RNA had already been seen in anal swabs and in feces, that actually these are infectious particles. And that, that probably once the virus gets into the gut, which is probably not so easy because it has, get, has to get through the stomach, but once it's in the gut, it can probably very productively stay there. And there are now multiple reports that even after you're, you're cured of your respiratory problems, it has no virus anymore in, in uh, respiratory swabs that you might still be spreading the virus. So in that sense, it's important. There's actually another paper, I'm not sure if it's online yet, from Hong Kong, from a, a lab that we have collaborated with, Jane Zhao, who uh, shows the same thing. Her paper was accepted earlier than our paper. She also shows that you can grow bat or gut organoids mm -hmm. and, um, and that they can be infected. Mm -hmm. Uh, wow. So this is, uh, I think, a fantastic application of organoids because now for all of these strange viruses that don't grow in human cells yet, that, that, that might jump, you can use bad organoids from any species mm. or maybe pangolin organoids. Mm. And uh, there are no cell lines for these animals. Okay, so, but you can grow organoids. You can do your viral studies on maybe the next epidemic on these organoids. 
Yeah, and that's the amazing power of organoids, right? It's what makes them such a brilliant model system for understanding the biology of, in this case, adult stem cells, but also pluripotent and kind of embryonic systems. It's the idea that you can kind of endow this in vitro experimental system with some of the uh, molecular, at least aspects of, you know, the, the physiological system. <clears throat> it gives you a lot of gains and mechanistic understanding. But now... And I mean, you just said something that's that's an insight that didn't even occur to me. So, I mean, it seems like the horizons are really distant for where, where it's going to stop with organoids, with bat organoids, pangolin organoids, really, uh, you know, intercalating into the research environment. But it seems like we're even pushing a new era of organoids in and of themselves with the complexity. Forget about the diversity of organisms we can get it from, but the complexity of the organoid itself with these compound organoids, multiple cell types. And you're a guy who caught, cast off the dogma when you were kind of looking at this system. You saw it and you explored the limits. What, what do you think the limits are for um, intestinal organoids? Do you think the colon is a good candidate for like making an actual colon uh, de novo from cells in a kind of organoid-like paradigm? Or do you think that that may be uh, uh, easier said than done? Yeah, so... Our type of organoids, so starting from adult stem cells, from adult tissues, um, is a is a simple type of organoid. So it's different from from IPS based organoids where you exploit development of organs or tissues, uh, and can can build part of the brain uh, or part of the kidney. Um, so ours only grow as epithelial elements. Hmm. Now, most internal organs, the sort of business part of the organ is its epithelium. So the liver is almost entirely epithelium. The lung is largely epithelial. Uh, most disease processes, most functionalities are in the epithelium of those organs. Um, so those we can grow. But of course, there are the blood vessels, the nerves, the immune cells, the fibroblasts, there's the collagen around it, the muscle uh, that we cannot grow under our conditions. Hmm. So all these non-epithelial elements are not present in our version of organoids. Jim Wells has been using you know, the, the IPS-based organoids to make stomach or, or small intestine. Um, he gets more complete organs. He gets some muscle. He can, he can add the enteric nervous system. Um, so eventually, I think after he takes IPS through this whole process, he then puts them under our conditions. So then he has a gut that, that will continue to grow based on our insights, but they're more complete. So that's one way, I think, of making more complete organs than the ones that we have that we call organoids. Uh, another one is by just simply adding elements, uh, which, which is, I mean, it's remarkable how self-organizing these structures are. I mean, it still amazes us every day that whatever you add, in terms of cells or even microbes, they will find uh, the right location and they'll make the, they contribute to the right structure. Mm. So I think it's, a, it's, it's going to be a matter uh, now for now of adding you know, mesodermal cells, you know, more, more cell types that you don't normally have. And then if you want to go on to build real organs, I think that we need to bring in uh, bioengineers who maybe have to provide Excel or matrix structures that they print on 3D printers. Um, have the blood vessels in the go in the right way because it's, I think it's asking a bit much from these simple cells to build a liver or one kilogram or something like that hmm. or a gut of eight meters. Hmm. Yeah, the organoid field has really exploded, especially over the last you know couple of years. But you know, let's come back to COVID nineteen just for another minute. Um, so you know, this whole era, you know, the whole era of COVID nineteen, which is kind of the focus of the scientific world right now, it's kind of really shifted the way we think about research, right? So I remember we talked with uh, Dr. Joseph Penninger a couple of episodes ago, and he actually said it was kind of like the Wild West right now, which I would kind of agree with in terms of preprint articles and how everybody's focused on COVID-19 research, regardless of whether or not you're actually doing virology in the first place. So what do you think is going to be like the scientific legacy of this time? How do you think this is going to change biomedical research, this COVID-19 era? Or do you think things will ultimately go back to the way they were before? Well, my fear would be that that sort of the, the people who give us our money uh, I know the, the the governments or the philanthropists that they will they will even more than they did in the past decade will force us to work on what 
what you know, whoever decides um, says is an important um, question. And uh, so my fear is that what we'll see is there will be a lot of money thrown at you know uh, studies of potential viruses that cause epidemics or more coronaviruses or more influenza virus, and that that the, the basic sciences will suffer more so than they've done in the past decade, and that the sort of the free research that at least part of scientists should be allowed to do will suffer. That is my biggest fear. And uh, I'm sure there's going to be a vaccine sooner or later. There's so many different tries and it's not, you know, it's just trial and error mostly. We know how to build vaccines, but we cannot predict very well which one will and which one will not work. There's, I think, over a hundred are currently in development. So it'll work, but then after that, probably this virus, we know how to deal with it. Um, but politicians might say, well, now we have to get you know, a vaccine for every virus that we know exists on this mm. planet. That would go at a big cost to science. Mm. Yeah, I, the vaccine is a kind of nice uh, metaphor for, for, uh, for I think what's going on here is that there's, like you said, there's all these experimental vaccines that are being tri tried. But ultimately, it may come down to what we know works, right? There may be some straightforward vaccine with the chemically neutralized viral components that you inject, just like vaccines we know. But of course, we have the RNA base and the DNA base. And similarly, in, in cell therapy and, and kind of regenerative medicine, you, you have a lot of trends and, and a lot of hype uh, that surrounded everything. I mean, you've been, you've been in the field for some time. I don't want to age you. You look, still look like a very young man. But um, you've been around, right? You've been around for the seminal identification of stem cells, of course, and then next the pluripotent stem cell boom, and then the reprogramming to IPS. So you've seen all these fads come, and some of them haven't gone, but uh, some of them have. Uh, but at the end of the day, just like I was saying with the vaccine idea, maybe it's the straightforward thing and cell therapy. The only routinely applied cell therapy is hematopoietic cell therapy, right? The gold standard because it works and it's been working for decades. Um, meanwhile, all the hopes for therapeutic transplantation of ES or IPS cells, it's, I mean, it's not behind. I think it's going at a good solid pace. But yeah, as you were alluding to, the public maybe or the government may be driving the research interests. And 20 years ago, we were promising five to 10 years revolutionary therapies. Right. Do you think that, you know, there's a lot of obstacles still. Do you think that it's it's uh, that the obstacles are, are going to be overcome? Uh, if so, how, how do you see that uh, happening? Yeah, I think we've all been a little uh, uh, eluded by the by the ease of the bone marrow stem cell. Essentially, my, so my wife is a bone marrow transplanter. Uh, you basically, I always thought before the medical school that you transplant like a kidney or heart, you transplant bone marrow. It's basically you inject it in a vein mm. and it's like blood, looks like blood. And the stem cells will find their way to the bone marrow and they know exactly where to go and, it, and that's it. So that, that procedure is extremely simple. You can freeze them. Um, you can still not expand them. So that's where I would say that, that many other organs uh, have the advantage. You can actually uh, take a bit of an organ, expand, and then make a lot of it, which, which cannot be done for bone marrow. Um, but I think that's what that's also where a lot of the mesenchymal stem cell work has gone wrong, that people thought you can just, just inject it in blood. And then, uh, like the bone marrow stem cell, they miraculously will then go to the heart muscle and will build heart muscle. And uh, so that is, I think, still a major problem that we have no clue how to deliver these cells to solid organs in such a way that they build, they help, they, they land in the right part of the structure and they start contributing to that organ. There, there is no, there's no, not much structure to bone marrow other than that there's these free floating cells that have to go into a niche. They don't have to build tubes or mm. they don't have to connect with nerves, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, it's essentially, and I view it as an open blood vessel where they sit in and sit in a niche. So that is, I think, has been a major, major setback. And all tries have been, you know, you make fantastic cells and you inject them hmm. in the organ or you inject them in the blood vessel. And nobody's ever realized that it's a fundamentally different thing to transplant the hemoviatic system or to repair any other solid organ hmm. with stem cells. 
Do you think and, though uh, that that the that we're making headway? Like I guess we recognize that, like you said, I think, or we're maybe in the midst of recognizing it for all organs. But Arun will tell you that that's been the problem. Delivery and maturity, there's a lot of obstacles there. Do you think yeah. we're making headway to the point where we're t- we've turned a corner or that we're, because we're, the expectations seem really high. I think this is the thing. Like my fear as well. It seems like maybe the, the basic science will be hijacked by this kind of corporate or science on demand because, you know, the taxpayers, et cetera. Um, do you think that, 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 we're going to be able to provide answers at the pace that the public needs? Or do you think these problems are much more complicated or much more complex than, than we've given them credit for? Well, I'm sure that you've had uh, multiple examples of, of, of transplants of stem cells in, in your podcasts, in your previous podcasts. So I think the eye is, is uh, where now people are trying to, uh, to treat blindness is good because the doctors are fantastic surgeons and they only need to replace uh, a, a little bit of tissue. And it's essentially a sheet if you do this, uh, this layer behind the retina. Um, yeah, the collaborator of Mamoru Watanabe, is, as we speak, is doing his trial now in Tokyo, where he grows gut organoids. And uh, as he's done with some help of us uh, five, six years ago in mice, where he showed you can actually transplant mouse to mouse and then human to mouse. He's now doing human to human, so gut organoids into a patient. Wow. Um, unfortunately, that has been halted now because of corona. Uh, mm. and hospitals don't really treat other patients unless it's an emergency. Mm. Uh, also in Japan, um, but there again, I think the, the 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 actual manipulation of transplanting. How do you transplant a sheet on the inside of the gut? Hmm. Of course, the skin. I think the skin is the one other fantastic example uh, done uh, 30 years ago already uh, by Howard Green and, and his co-workers. Uh, that is also a sheet, but you can stick it on the outside. You can glue it on, and it grows and it works. Hmm. But the region and then the cornea, of course, is is done in the same way. So yeah, I guess it seems like organ to organ. Some some organs, it's it's like a practical thing. It's kind of like it's the, the the obstacles sometimes seem completely arbitrary, but they're they're real and can be overcome maybe just based on what the system is. But yeah, that's. I mean, it seems like we are making headway according to those examples. I forget that that uh, we are transplanting cells, right? So it seems like oh. uh, the future is bright. Yeah, to help solve some of these issues with, you know, transplantation, we're going to we're going to need some new technologies. And I think the reality in the the modern age of biomedical science is that there are so many powerful technologies that are emerging, especially right now, to complement each other really well. And one of them is genome editing. And so your lab recently intersected genome editing with organoid technology to develop technologies like CRISPR hot, for example, which you can use for knock in a fluorescent reporters and it was published in nature cell biology. And you actually also had a cell stem cell paper using base editing to correct mutations in cystic fibrosis organoids. So talk a little bit about the intersection of these technologies and how genome editing might be able to take organoid research to the next level. Yeah, we actually did this already um, seven or eight years ago when we, we had these cystic fibrosis organoids growing. And uh, uh, Gerald Schwenk and I like together with uh, uh, Bong Kyung Ko, who's now in, in Vienna, originally from Korea, they, uh, without me knowing, had ordered the, the CRISPR Cas9 kit that was then available uh, right after these science papers came out from uh, Chapanche and Doudna. And I think they were the first to repair a gene in human in a human stem cells in hereditary disease. This is a, I think, a cell stem cell paper, and. Uh, so they told me they only showed me the experiment when it had worked. I didn't even know uh, I hadn't did I hadn't signed any orders or anything. Uh, but that got us thinking about that that it was that it was actually quite easy to use CRISPR somehow. Um, Organoids, the way they grow, they're fantastic in high fidelity DNA repair. I think that's the reason why they're so stable. So you can use homologous recombination uh, for, for to make anything. So we've done that for a number of years. And then, as you mentioned, the, the base editor uh, came around. Um, that works very well. And the, the crisp paint works fantastically well. So, yeah, we feel that we can essentially design 
any genetic change now with the toolkit has been generated by multiple labs. And so the, the organoids are clonable, like IPS cells are clonable. So you can actually, once you make a number of them, you can just very carefully go through the clones that you made and pick one where everything has gone right, where you have the mutation or the change that you want, but nothing else. And that's a great advantage. If you treat uh, with CRISPR uh, in vivo in a patient, you might actually hit things that you don't want to hit. You have no control over it. You have no way to find out if it happened. Only you know, when things go wrong and maybe a tumor develops. So I think that yeah, this marriage of, of organoid technology and CRISPR is extremely powerful in yeah. combination with single cell sequencing. I think those three technologies are amazing. Of course, you have to mention, mention single cell sequencing. It would not be a show if we did not mention single cell sequencing. So <laughs> glad you yep. got that in there. Um, I just want to circle back quickly to uh, how you started that answer, talking about how your postdoc, you just went ahead, postdocs, uh, they just went ahead and ordered this kit and, you know, they had the, the wherewithal and the, the, you know, the ambition to do it. And then they came to you pr with pretty much a cell stem cell paper. That's, that must be nice. I mean, it's a, it's a huge lab and I get it that you've, it's taken them many years to work toward this, um, and yeah, like you, you've got the ball rolling to the point where you've got all these things uh, working. Um, but it's 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 a lot of output. I mean, we talked about all those papers. Uh, that was like, I think it was in like the space of three days that all those came out. No, I'm joking. But it's a tr it's a tremendous output. And it also it's got to be a, a monumental responsibility. Um, but logistically, it doesn't even seem possible. Uh, and at the very least, it must be really exhausting for you. It seems like you do delegate a lot of these responsibilities or lean on some of your brilliant postdocs, but still, it's it's a lot. So how do you manage that? And also from a scientific perspective, you know, I guess from my perspective, at least I can say, it seems like when you have so much, so much output and you just kind of forgot whether it was a cell stem cell paper or, or other some other high impact journal, I, I don't think I would ever, you know, fail to recall which paper was in which high impact journal. But when you have so many, it makes sense. So what keeps you going scientifically? Like what motivates you when you've achieved everything? What, what why do you get up in the morning and go to work still? No, I think about, about, so when my lab started running the way I'd hoped it would work, which means, um, everybody has total freedom. There's enough financial, uh, room space that actually people can try things out um, and and then when I, when I started attracting good people and I learned that that the atmosphere of the lab that we set up where people trust each other to help each other is a, this is a thing about the Dutch social culture is that everything has to be social you don't do things on your mm -hmm. own so, and that has been an important part. People collaborate very easily. People teach each other. So older lab members will, will help younger lab members. If a paper has a hard time, other people automatically, it's like a self-organizing, it's like an organoid, my lab. <laughs> now, you, <say. laughs> you need a mix of, a mix of different individuals. And uh, so they know that they, they're allowed space if they don't do stupid things. They're not allowed to hide things. They're not allowed to not help. Uh, that is a very strict rule. Um, so everything is shared with them. If you ask for help, you help. Uh, mm. Outside labs, if anybody wants a mouse that we made or a reagent, we always give it. We give out, usually give out information on papers not yet published freely. Um, it's also a trick for me to keep my postdocs on their toes because once they know that they talked about their discovery, they know they have to speed up. So mm. uh, that's, that's one little trick. <laughs> um, so, so about 20, 30 years ago, I felt, well, 20 years ago, I felt, you know, this is a lab that I'm happy with. And it was no longer that I wanted to go anywhere. I just wanted to keep this lab the way it was and just make discoveries. And I get extremely excited by seeing new things, finding out new that every day is different. I'm also a doctor by training originally. And I learned that over the years, you have fewer and fewer of those moments that, you know, your next day will be a big surprise. I see all my friends from medical school then, they, 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 the door opens, the patient walks in. Although it's a very, very difficult job, uh, you have to know a lot, but it, it becomes routine in the end. Most mm. of it becomes routine, mm. never everything. But in science, you know, I'm not, I have no clue what we'll be researching a year from now. 
Mm. And I'm sure they hope it will be interesting and hope we'll make another discovery. But, uh, you know, that's, there's nothing else. It's not, you're not going anywhere else. It's just, I like being in this and doing this. And if I live another 20, 30, 40 years, I'll be doing this. Mm. Sounds like a fun place to be and good people and good science with you at the helm. And you're perhaps running the biggest organoid lab in the world. And we've covered so many of your lab's papers in the last few months, all published in major journals. So you're Mr. Organoid in a time when the stem cell field is quickly shifting towards organoid and 3D cultures. But I still have to ask, in your opinion, are there still good reasons as to why we might still want to use traditional two-dimensional cell culture for disease modeling, for example, or should we all just jump on the organoid train and aim to use nothing but three-dimensional cultures? Well, I would say that that, that uh, they probably model uh, most processes better than the 2D cell lines, but 2D cell lines are much faster, much cheaper. They're very well characterized. Many of them are very well known. So the, I think the, the, the organoids just, just occupy a space between the simple cheap to use and, and, and fast to use cell lines and animal models. Or if you don't want to do animal models, no human human trials. And so it's not as if they are replacing much, I think. I think cell lines were being used uh, for applications where they have not turned out to be extremely useful, where I think now organoids do, do much better. Um, and, and I think the organoids the organoid field will expand the more technologies people develop, the more complex organoids can be generated, you know, incorporating immune cells, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but I think it always starts with a simple cell line. Hmm. Um, so uh, I just want to now circle back to the final scientific question of the interview. I want to circle back to the beginning because you said something that really inspired me. And I think maybe some other investigators out there may feel similarly, and it's refreshing to hear. You said, you know, at some points in your career, you just looked at a system, you know, you would just look at it and see what happened. And the, the revelations, the insights would come out of it if you use really good tools and you had a good approach. But I think that's so contrary to what a lot of people in my training have have kind of instructed me that it's not worth in, you know, embarking on the scientific study until you have a very careful and well constructed hypothesis in question that is, you know, based in a solid rationale, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Can you make the case briefly, if you can, for what is the benefits of just having an open mind and just looking at a system and seeing what shakes out? Yeah, so what you describe is essentially how we write our papers. It's also how we write our grants, right? We have some preliminary work, a fantastic phenomenon, and we have a hypothesis or multiple hypotheses. We're going to test this, and we know exactly what we're going to do in the next four years. Now, this is this is not the case in basic science. This never happens because if you could sit on a chair and 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 formulate an answer to your question, uh, which is is a hypothesis, um, you wouldn't have to do experiments. And it turns out that you always get surprised by, uh, surprised by experiments. So the rule in my lab is, is not to have hypotheses. And this is not what people have learned. People have learned, so you ask a question, you have your hypothesis, and then you, you, you know, try to get rid of the hypothesis or confirm the hypothesis. Um, now, the hypothesis was your answer that you made up, which is extremely unlikely to be true. <laughs> Because there is maybe a thousand, you no, know, evolu- essentially we're historians. We're, we're tracing back what, how evolution had solved that particular problem you're looking at. And, they, and you can sit on a chair and come up with a thousand solutions. Evolution randomly picked one that, that was good enough and then moved on. And how would you in your chair ever decide which one there was? Mm. So I don't believe in hypothesis. And the problem with hypothesis is the way the, the, the human mind works. Once you have your hypothesis, you are going to prove it. Yes. That's why you get these fights between scientists, you know, for their entire life, believe that they know the truth and the other person does not know the truth. And uh, so and uh, to have a real open mind is the only way to find out how a biological system works. Mm-hmm. And it's very difficult, very difficult to not be opinionated, not to have an opinion preformed when you start addressing a new issue. Um, but I, and then so at one point I was asked, getting back to the grants, um, I was present with the Royal Academy for a while. And I had to explain a lot to lay audiences how science works. And I've people figured this out that, that whenever we have hypothesis, it's usually the project goes wrong. 
and then we have no hypothesis that it goes goes the right way. So it, I, I was then asked, so in your in your grant, you write up what you're going to do, and but where do your papers come from? So I checked you now all of our more visible papers, and there was only there was almost none for which I had had a grant hmm. to work on that subject. Because it was always a uh, an observation done in the margins of some ongoing project that we realized this is much bigger if it's if we understand this than what we're actually going after. Hmm. And almost all our papers, um, I had no grant to do that work. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. Incredible scientific and life tips from one of the luminaries in our field, Dr. Hans Klebers. And before we let you go, we're going to ask you a couple of science peripheral questions to help our listeners get to know you a little bit better. So starting off, what was your greatest or a memorable scientific revelation or surprise? In other words, an aha moment or and and also what was the greatest disappointment or surprise where the result wasn't exactly what you were expecting or hoping to get? Well, the first one I have a, I have a good <laughs> I have a reply. The second one I don't, I'm not really sure if you know one. Um, <laughs> Well, there was, almost everything goes wrong. So, uh, and then sometimes more spectacular than other times. But uh, uh, no. So the the one real well, there were two eureka moments. One was when uh, when Nick Barker did his first linear tracing experiment from the other five mice, and uh, so this was like three, four, five years work. And there was a single moment that we actually could look at what he produced. And we got these beautiful blue stripes that, that, that go from the bottom of the crypt to the tip of the villas that had been seen very different ways already. So we knew what we had to see. Um, so it was in, in sort of in one, uh, on one glance at this sample, we realized, so I sat, back, I sat down with Nick the next day. And we just wrote out, you know, we're going to do this, 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 this. And I think it was like 10 LT5 follow-up papers that mm -hmm. were all planned. So that was a moment we could plan. They were all planned with Nick. And I said, okay, Nick, what are you going to do? Uh, you cannot do everything. Uh, do the things you pick, you do. And the other, I'll, I'll involve other people in the lab. Uh, you have to be, you know, you have to realize this is going to happen. You'll be involved. It will not be your project. Mm -hmm. So that was one moment. But we had really we were looking for that, and then the other was when uh, when Toshi Sato grew his first mini guts, and uh, it's a little bit of an anecdote that he had just started in the lab and he'd been trying to grow crypts in Tokyo in his during his PhD as a gastroenterologist uh, in 2D, so he could do it a little bit, but they would stop growing after you know like all cells, and people knew that will always happen uh, after a week or so. And uh, so we sat together when he started in my lab, and, and he was convinced that maybe this should be done in 3D. So we came up with Matrigel. Um, we, uh, I think, Mina Bissell actually suggested that to us. And we knew quite a bit about the growth factors from randomly knocking out all sorts of things in the gut. So we know about wind, we know about EGF receptor, we know about the blocking BMP with knocking in from, from transgenomy. So we basically made up that cocktail. And then Toshi had, I think he broke a, a sword or something like that. And, and, and uh, somebody else in my lab, Mark van der Wetering, got angry at him. And so, so I didn't see Toshi after, the, <laughs> after some time. And then I walked into a lab, you know, some, a number of weeks later, and Toshi was there looking, you know, looking down the microscope. And I said, how's it going? He said, okay. So, and are they growing? And he said, yes. I said, for how long? <laughs> he said, well, you know, for two months. He said, why didn't you tell me? He said, well, you didn't ask. <laughs> so then I look down this microscope and you see these, well, you've seen these extremely viable, you know, vital structures that almost grow under your eyes. And uh, so that was another, we immediately realized, because yeah, what I didn't say, what we really tried to do there was producing more stem cells, like IPS cells or ES cells. Mm. They're just hoping to start from one stem cell and end up with 10,000 stem cells. But we got these things that we didn't know what they were. Mm. And then he, we eventually realized these are just the cells are trying to make a, a mini gut. And uh, so that was something we never we were never intending to do. But anyway, that was another Eureka moment. Yeah, I thought you were going to ask about my my two favorite <laughs> mentors or something like that. <laughs> oh no, that we're we're getting to that. So I mean, a lot of these eureka moments from your lab have you know really changed the stem cell research world. So you know, you're a you're a hero for a lot of people in the stem cell field, like myself in, included. But you know, you've certainly have your own scientific heroes, right? So who are those? Yeah, so there's actually 
two guys have been this has been asked to meet before and uh, I think these are really the guys who inspired me most and one was my chemistry teacher at high school who sold chemistry equipment and chemicals in evenings from his shed in the back of his garden mm-hmm. and uh, so I had a, a chemistry lab on the attic of my of my parents when I was 14 or 15 this is where I, I really got attracted to uh, to I could have been an incredible nerd or maybe I'm a nerd but I then started playing lots of sports and so but that was really that was my idea I have to be there I have to be a scientist mm-hmm. and the guy was called uh, de Brabander so I've never seen him since, but I really realized that he made me uh, a lab person, an experimental lab person. Oh. And the other person is my PhD mentor, uh, Rudy Balieu, who very old, still lives, uh, was a cellular immunologist. And I don't think I learned so much from sort of the, the basics of science, but what he what he taught me is that trust is incredibly important in science. Trust in yourself that you actually, when you have an idea or, you know, that you actually, you can do it. Uh, but more importantly, trust in anybody around you that you actually allows you to collaborate or uh, allows you to, to build up friendships and networks. And uh, so that's something I might've said it in a different way that I've tried to, to have in my lab that I will not accept anybody who, who doesn't trust people in the lab, who feels that they should hide things or that it's competitive with the other postdocs in the lab or it's competitive with our, with our, uh, with our collaborators. So I'm always trying to, you know, we trust everybody, we share everybody. You'll get in to return what you give. And that I think is true. It sounds maybe a little soft, but I think it's true if you're, if you're always a giver in science, you'll get more back than you'll ever get in any other way. And it's more fun. Yeah, well, we've heard that echoed by some of the uh, most august scientists that we've had on the show. Most recently, Joe Penninger said the exact same thing. For uh, You give away, you talk to 10 people, eight people will help you, two people will steal your idea. That's a net gain. Uh, I think what's great about your answer there is that uh, a lot of people might expect, you know, Einstein or some famous, you know, Watson and Crick, whatever. But uh, it's true, I think, in a lot of cases that the, the scientific heroes that we have are the people that inspire us, right? And inspire us with ideas, either introducing us to science or inspiring us with ideas that aren't so much scientific, but they're just about the, the idea of how science should be conducted, in this case, um, with trust. And it's amazing to see that you've now uh, instilled your own lab with that. And there's going to be a whole generation of scientists, you know, considering your output, a whole generation of scientists, they're going to hold you up as an inspiration, um, by the same token. So thank you so much for sharing that and all the things you've shared with us in this interview. I think it's a really refreshing chat with somebody who really gives zero Fs at this point because you've done it all and you can tell the truth. And I think the truth is really refreshing. So thanks again, Hans. Okay, it was very nice talking. Bye. All right, you guys, that brings us to the end of this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or by email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. We ran the gamut today, Arun, from Seek This and Seek That to all kinds of organoids with the godfather of organoids himself. What a great discussion. For our listeners, we'll be back in a couple weeks with another exciting episode. Thanks for listening, you guys.